All right, uh, so uh, welcome to the second part of the semantics uh, uh, lecture. And uh, I'm going to, um, I apologize in advance, that this is the first time that I've done this on this, um, on this uh, uh, platform. Uh, and so I'm um, not entirely sure how everything works, but okay, so you should be seeing right now uh, I think you are the uh, PowerPoint, and then in the little window, there we are. Say hi to the class. Um, this is our face-to-face -face student. Um, all right. So, uh, in the first uh, uh, lecture, we talked about uh, semantics, and uh, you know we came to the uh, final conclusion that you know that, uh, there's a a variety of theories of uh, semantics uh, and that of course the most uh, popular one, the one that um, uh, has been sort of most widely accepted uh, is uh, uh, the truth functional uh, semantics that ties um, the meaning of sentences with their, their truth uh, uh, functions. Uh, today we're going to move on to uh, a different uh, um, uh, aspect which is the importance of uh, context, okay? And uh, so uh, let's just uh, uh, jump in. Um, so, so as I was saying, you know, so far we've looked only um, at semantics as essentially a function of the referent, okay? So in other words, um, you know, what, what, we, what you can call extensional uh, semantics, okay? That is where we say, well, how's the reality in the world? And, your sentence corresponds to the to the reality uh, in the world, but of course there's different approaches, as I was saying uh, a minute ago, and uh, a very important one, although less um, popular, uh, is this idea of meaning as a mental fact. Okay, and uh, you may find uh, this labeled mentalism sometimes uh, disparagingly and say, oh, well, that's just a mentalistic uh, position. Um, another term for it is intentional uh, semantic. And notice that intentional with an S, not with a T, okay? Um, so, um, you know, we're talking about different approaches uh, with very uh, different uh, sort of set of, uh, of, of background, different uh, set of, um, um, uh, presuppositions on how on how uh, things are organized. By the way, can you see the screen? There. Okay. Um, so 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 then let's look at what are uh, these uh, these uh, different views that um, intentional uh, semantic has. Well, first of all, the idea is that meaning is in your head. Okay, it's a mental representation. It's a concept. It's a thought. Okay. So, so from this perspective, it's a way more complex view of meaning than the referential uh, semantics, because meaning is not just the, the reference, but it's what the speakers are thinking, right? And, and now, so obviously that's a very big uh, thing, which is, by the way, precisely what scared off the behaviors, right? They said, oh my God, if, if you start thinking in terms of, oh, what are the speakers thinking, you don't know where to stop, right? Whereas if you're thinking in terms of reference, well, that's fairly clear was, uh, was the reference, right? So, so if you take the word beer, for example, right? Um, you know, a, uh, an extensional semantics would say, well, beer is whatever is out there in the world that is beer. Um, but an intentional semanticist would say, beer is what you think when you think of the word beer, right? And so the, the thoughts that you produce when you're thinking of beer uh, is, is that, okay? Now, um, we now go into uh, uh, context, um, which is very important for, for what follows, okay? So there's kind of a discontinuity here, okay? That is, so don't say, wait, I don't understand how did we go from intentional semantics to context? There's a gap. You will understand later when, when we talk about it, why I, I went to, to context. There's a, there's a reason uh, here, okay? So, so what's context? Well, there's, there's many ways of, of, of looking at it. 
um, you know, and, and I've given you definitions uh, there. Uh, but basically, you can think of it in many ways as uh, the situation in which um, in which uh, uh, things happen. And I, I have here a um, another slide uh, here. And now, of course, interestingly, uh, I, don't to, I don't know which one you're seeing. So. We're going to share that one. Okay, so now you are seeing the other uh, slide. So you can think of it as the situation in which a sentence is uttered. Okay, so if you say the sentence, you know, Mary loves John, in what circumstances is Mary loves John being uttered? Okay. So who's saying you that Mary loves John, right? Um, it makes a huge difference. When and where does the utterance take place? It makes a huge difference. What are they doing at the time, right? If they are two spies that are meeting in the park, it may be the, the secret password to identify the other spy, right? And so it has nothing to do with, with Mary and John being involved. If one of the two people is John's uh, uh, wife, then yeah, it's it's a pretty uh, different business uh, than if you're just announcing to your friends that Mary and John are, are, are in love, right? Um, you know, what do you think about um, uh, being in love? Is it a good thing, is it a bad thing? You know, what f facial expressions are the, the people involved making, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that's the um, the kind of thing that um, that um, is part of uh, context. Okay. Um, so let's go back to um, to the other PowerPoint. So context, as I said, it's kind of a situation. It's kind of the the, the situation in a very broad sense in which um, you know, a sentence uh, occurs or, or an exchange. I mean, it's not just a single sentence. You can have conversations, et cetera, right? So, so it is the setting in which something occurs very broadly understood, including you know, things like background knowledge. There is things that you know about the world and about communication that you don't need to, to repeat every time. So one of the reasons why context matters uh, so much is precisely the phenomenon of indexicality and, and the ICSIS, uh, at large. Um, because, because indexicals are words that the meaning of which is dependent on the context, okay? So for example, the tense, um, you know, whether something is past, present, or future has to do with the time of speaking, okay? So if I say, I went to the store, it means that at some time prior to the time of speaking right now, um, the action of going to the store took place. If I say, I will go to the store, it means that at a time past that of the time of speaking, I will go to the store, right? So, so the, the, the tense is based on this contextually based definition of time of speaking, right? Which you can only know if you know where the situation is and when it's taking place, right? Um, you know, and then, you know, things like um, I versus you, right? Again, that, that if, I, if I, only I can say I, right? Um, you know, you can say I when you're talking, right? But otherwise, I am I, you're you, right? And so that means the spe I is the speaker, you is the hearer, he or she is a, is a third person that's neither the speaker nor the hearer that we're talking about. Okay, so again, you can see how these are very context specific. They're based on the situation in which uh, the, the, the utterance, the, the conversation uh, takes place. And some deictic um, expressions are things like come and go. Come indicates movement towards the speaker. Go indicates movement away uh, from the speaker, right? You cannot, get, you cannot say go here. 
a meaning to yourself. Right? You can say go there, right? Because it's, uh, it's far away. All right. Um, so that's an important way in which uh, context, uh, uh, you know, in, in affects uh, uh, speech. But it's actually extremely important um, in the process of disambiguation. Okay. Um, so here we have uh, um, uh, an example. Uh, John stacked the beer in the fridge, which is perfectly fine. But then if you have John stack the rainwater in the pool, that's weird, right? So, so why is that weird? More precisely, what is weird about uh, stacking rainwater uh, in the pool? Well, what's weird is that, of course, our knowledge of rainwater and of beer tells us that beer comes in containers namely cans or bottles, well, I guess kegs, but that's a different, uh, that's a different thing, um, you know, which are stackable, okay, and that fit in a fridge, unlike a keg, right? Whereas rainwater doesn't, right? So, so that's why stacking the beer is fine, uh, because you, you intuit that what we really mean is stack the cans of beer or stack the bottles of beer, um, whereas rainwater, you need to have a story that says that we poured the rainwater into the, the bottles and then we stack them in the fridge, okay? So we'll say more about this in frame semantics, which is what we uh, turn that next. But again, keep in mind that we're going, to, we're talking about intentional semantics and we talked about context because context turns out to be part of uh, how you define um, intentional uh, semantics, okay? So um, here we have to take sort of a detour outside of linguistics, uh, uh, largely outside of linguistics per se, um, and mostly inside artificial intelligence, which today you, you may be aware of artificial intelligence as Watson and uh, you know, that, that beat uh, the, the world uh, chess uh, master and then these uh, you know, facial recognition software or Google Translate and, and these, these things. Um, here we're talking about artificial intelligence in the 1970s, uh, and these are Shan Cabos and so on. These are names that, um, um, you know, important names at the time. Um, you know, these guys were trying to get computers to think like humans think. Um, Watson and uh, these, uh, the, the Google Translate and so on, do not think like humans do. It's a completely different uh, uh, thing. Uh, whereas here, they were really trying to emulate uh, uh, humans. Um, and in the process of doing so, they came up with this idea of frames or scripts or schemata. So there's various terms uh, for that. And so, so the whole idea starts from Bartlett, who's a psychologist. And he talks about schema theory, and, and schema have plural schemata, by the way. Um, you know, he has this uh, schema, uh, the, the schema that is basically a set of memories that you have of something that gets sort of uh, hardened into a structure, a mental uh, structure. Um, case grammar is a... Um, aspect of, uh, of linguistics that's very, very interesting. Uh, we cannot get into it, but basically the idea is that uh, in a sentence you have an agent, you have somebody that bears the consequences of the action, uh, you have an instrument with which the action is performed, and so on and so forth. These are called cases, right? And so Fillmore said, you know, you can identify these them and describe them, um, you know, and then turns out that these cases tend to repeat themselves. So you kind of build like a, a frame-like structure. Uh, and in fact, that's what, uh, that's what Fillmore uh, 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 did, right? Uh, and we'll see in, in a second in more, in more detail. So here, here's an example, uh, so more discussion of, of, of Bartlett. Um, you know, this is a quote from, from an article uh, on it. Uh, so you can see here at the bottom, the definition that I just gave you chunks of complex knowledge which are stored in long-term memory, right? So it's bits of information that get uh, chunked uh, together 
and then um, they they are memorized. They're retained in uh, in memory. Right. So here's uh, Fillmore's uh, case drama. So as I said, there's an agent, there's an object, uh, an instrument, a beneficiary, and somebody who benefits from the from the action. You know, so so that kind of thing. So an example would be Mary gave John a flower. Gave, of course, is the verb, right? So Mary is the agent, John is the beneficiary, and flower is the object of uh, the act, right? So, so this is how case grammar uh, worked. Um, so let's see then what these, uh, you know, so as I said uh, a minute ago here, um, you know, these guys in artificial intelligence using ideas from Bartlett and from Fillmore, etc., uh, developed uh, uh, this idea of frames, and this is what a frame looked like. Okay, so this is a very famous one, uh, you know, the, the restaurant uh, frame, um, because the Shank and Abelson, and the, you know, we're talking about like 1975, the first publication, then it was in their 77 book, which was one of the uh, sort of basic books in, in, in artificial intelligence at the time. So they describe the event of going to the restaurant, right? And so, so the idea is that, that they, they take it from the beginning, you know, so you move, P trans stands for a movement. So you move yourself into the restaurant. In other words, you go to the restaurant, right? Then, um, so you look at, with your eyes, to the empty tables, you find yourself a place to sit, you take yourself to the table, and then you sit down, right? So obviously this is one of those restaurants where there isn't a maitre d' that takes you to the table. You, it's a seat yourself kind of restaurant, right? So then you get a menu, you read it, you decide what you want, and then you place the order with the, with the waitress. So this is not a cafeteria style restaurant, it's a waitress, uh, uh, wait staff uh, kind, of, um, kind of thing, right? Uh, and then the point is you get the food, you eat it, you ask for your check, you, you tip, you, you go pay, and you move out, you go out of the restaurant, right? So based on this information, the idea then was that a computer and artificial intelligence would know that if you had a story that said, we went to the restaurant, uh, we sat down, we ordered the food, um, uh, but we never got the food and then we, we paid and left, that would be very strange because you're supposed to get the food and eat it, right? Or if you say, we got the food but didn't eat it and then we left, something is wrong, right? Maybe the food wasn't good, maybe you know, something, something came up, right? But so that, this was the idea. It was the information about how you do something, right? And the idea is that this was stored, this particular thing here, the, 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 the restaurant script in Shank and Abelson was stored in the memory of a computer. But the idea then was that these frames would be stored also in the memory of people, right? And the, the transition was very uh, easy. Here's another example of, a, of another kind of frame by Marvin Minsky, also a great uh, uh, scholar in the uh, artificial intelligence community. I once met uh, Minsky, um, had, we had an argument, that was awesome. Um, you know, so, so in this case, it's boy, right? And so here you can see the, the, um, uh, the, the subject. Uh, ESA means what is your uh, hyperordinate, you know, your, your uh, hypernym. Uh, sex, uh, age, uh, home, this is all uh, information that's normal. Then it says you number of legs, two. Uh, because you and you inherit this from person, right? Because so inheritance is this idea, which is very helpful. That if you are a um, uh, well, so for example, a fruit would inherit from so an orange would inherit from fruit that it is a plant, right? That they grew on a plant, right? And and fruit, all fruit grows on a plant. Well, oh yeah, no, still because they they still haven't done. Uh, they're working on artificial meat. Uh, nobody's working on artificial vegetables. <laughs> um, all right, so here's another uh, example. 
Um, so this is really a definition, sort of a more general definition, you know, as a organized complex of information about a, a given part of the world, right? Um, the, the key words here are organized, because obviously it's not random bits of information, it's structured. Complex, meaning it's not just one bit of information, there's a lot of information there. About a given part of the world means that you can have a script for pretty much anything. It can be you have a script for glasses, you have a script for cup, but you also have a script for marriage, divorce, um, lawsuit, uh, you know, football team, uh, things that are very vague and abstract. Uh, and you can have, um, you know, scripts for like um, um, string theory which is an enormous uh, complex of mathematical uh, ideas, right? So it doesn't have to be necessarily about small things or, or relatively, you know, day-to-day -day things like restaurants, okay? It can, be, it can be complicated. And then, of course, that is stored in the knowledge of the speakers. That is, this is long-term uh, memory uh, stuff. Now, the other thing that we need to emphasize um, is that the, the scripts are, are connected into a large network uh, of knowledge about the world, right? So in other words, remember that we said a minute ago uh, here when we were looking at um, this, that boy is a person, right? It's a, so the per person is the, the hypernym of, of boy, the uh, more general uh, term, right? Um, so, so that's a link between the concept of person and the concept of boy, right? So you can think of it as a, as a line that connects boy and uh, uh, person, right? And here's an example of what we're talking about, right? So we have tree is a plant, right? A plant is a living thing, right? An animal is also a living thing. A bird is an animal. Right, and you can see the link here that is a uh, label, right? Um, you know, and here you have uh, flower is a plant. Here they forgot that the is a uh, for 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 uh, between tree and plant, but it's the same. Uh, it's the same thing. We we know that it has to be there, right? And so you can see that uh, that uh, your your semantic network has other uh, links as well. You have like. Um, uh, has, that's the parts, uh, you know, um, is that indicates, for example, in this particular case, color, you know, green, uh, red, yellow, uh, red, etc. And so, um, you know, so there's other links as well. And, uh, you know, the idea is that all these links are active when they get activated by, um, you know, because you're paying attention to, to it, okay? This is called spreading um, activation, okay? So then the idea of um, intentional semantics is that what's in that meaning is these scripts, these frames in the semantic network that gets activated as needed to understand and process the situation, right? So, so then, then you have an alternative theory to uh, the referential semantics, the, the um, you know, meaning as, as the referent. Here it's meaning in the head. And what's in the head? Well, frames and scripts and the semantic network, okay? So what are the pros and cons of uh, uh, this, um, uh, these um, uh, terms? Uh, on the pro side, first of all, it matches the complexity of natural language. Um, you know, with referential semantics, there's no way that you could handle, um, you know, something like, um, uh, I don't know, the difference between a cockroach and a palmetto bug. No, they're the same thing, right? But so, so you would need that bit of information would not be something that you could encode in your, in your uh, theory. Um, so they represent the frames, represent the knowledge of the world that referential semantics ignores and just refers to what are you referring to, right? 
Um, and, you know, of course, as I said, rich, uh, rich semantics that can handle pretty much anything. On the con side, um, is, it's difficult to do. Uh, creating these scripts, I mean, here, what I've given you here, for example, these are toy examples that we, that we determine. These things like this, you know, these are toy uh, samples that were just done to see whether you could get a computer to work with it. Uh, I've done it, um, and I can, I can tell you from, from um, first-hand experience, it's very, very hard to do. It takes hours of work, and uh, not everybody can be trained to, to do it. Some, some people, they just find it almost impossible to do. So it's very expensive to do because you have to have trained people, uh, and it's not easy to train them. Um, and then the other thing is that whereas in um, uh, referential semantics, you have predicate calculus ready to go uh, to do your reasoning and do inferences and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And we're going to talk about this in a, in a, in a minute. In uh, frame semantics, it's much harder to reason about your content. It's, it's feasible, um, but it's much harder. You don't, you cannot just say, oh, let's just use predicate calculus and calculate uh, the, the, the inferences. It's way more complex uh, than that. All right, so we're gonna break here for us. All right, so we're back and let's get back the um, PowerPoint here. Oh, not wrong, uh, sorry. Sorry, my bad. I said that there would be problems. There were, we're encountering them. All right. So um, we said the pros and cons of uh, frame uh, semantics. Um, now we sort of need to move on a little bit, and and I want to talk about uh, the difference between denotation and connotation. Um, because it's kind of important to understand the distinction here to understand another reason why um, uh, frame semantics, script semantics is, is more flexible than referential semantics. So, um, and, and you may have encountered the word connotation before if you studied literature, because sometimes they say that, uh, you know, the connotations of a word is kind of like a, a um, uh, you know, sometimes it's used in literary criticism, that, that kind of thing. So the idea here is that the denotation of a word is the sense, the meaning of the word. And then the connotation goes beyond this uh, meaning, right? So, um, you know, uh, a good example is, you know, if you look at bachelor and spinster, right? So, so if you look at the, at, at the meaning of the two words, one means a male person who is not married and as an adult, that's bachelor. And spinster means a unmarried female adult, right? So therefore, it should be perfectly fine to say to a, uh, a woman, oh, you're a spinster, you know? And of course, if you try that, you know, they'll hit, they'll hit you on the head with a stick. Um, because of course, so, but you might say, well, what did I just say? That you are an unmarried female, um, adult, right? So are you not, right? And, and uh, she'll hit you again with the stick, <laughs> right? It's very dangerous to be a linguist, by the way, in case you don't you know, figure that out. Um, you know, but because of course, the difference is that bachelor has positive connotations. You know, so you have the bachelor party, right? It's, it's a fun party where, where people get crazy and so on. And that's why when the wedding industry created bachelor parties for women, they didn't call them spinsters parties. Although I personally would love to be invited to a spinsters party, that'd be awesome. They called them bachelorette party, right? Because the, they wanted the connotations of fun, you know, I don't know, uh, I don't know what else, but, but fun and exciting. Um, you know, I mean, sexually uh, free, I suppose, is part of the of the thing. But they wanted those connotations. They didn't want the connotations of spinster, which are, of course, negative. Okay, the idea being, well, you're an adult, 
unmarried woman because no one will take you, right? That's the connotation, okay? Not that I uh, approve this. I'm just saying what the, what the meaning is. So the traditional definition, as I said, you know, you, you may have encountered this in literary studies, is like it's an aura of meaning around the core uh, of the denotation. Right? It, that's a metaphorical definition. It doesn't really say uh, much, except give you a, a vague idea of what it is. The modern definition is, if you go back to the network here, right? the connections between all the words are your connotations, okay? That is, you know, if you uh, looked at, um, for example, Bachelor, there would be a link going to drinks and a, drink, and a link to go to, you know, hangs out and, you know, in bars and has fun and, and so on and so forth, right? So all of these links would be the connotations of the word Bachelor, whereas Spinster would have different links uh, that would be like, you know, I don't know, stays at home, cries, you know, whatever. Uh, I don't know. I've got no idea at this point right, what, what the connotations are. Okay, but so, um, so that would be, um, you know, uh, the connections would be the connotations of, of the words. Now, and now I'm wrapping up my argument. Connotations are non-propositional, non-truth functional meanings. Now you will remember, and if you don't remember this, slap yourself really hard on the head with your hand or whatever other object you have. I'm kidding, don't, don't do that. That might be dangerous. But go back to the end of the last lecture and look at the Chow example that I gave as an example of non-truth functional meaning that was problematic to handle with um, the truth functional uh, semantics, referential uh, semantics, right? So this here, instead, you can handle very easily without batting an eye with frame semantics, okay? So if you look at the dog is barking versus the mutt is barking, they're both animals, they're both canines, and so on and so forth, but mutt has the extra connotation that it is a dog that is not a purebred, okay? So in other words, it is sort of a cheapy dog kind. Uh, come in, grab, grab a chair. Um, so, so this difference would be accounted by uh, the presence of another link that would connect mutt to dog. It would be non, uh, non. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, pedigree uh, dog. All right. So, the, a mutt is a dog without without a pedigree. If you scoot over, they can see you. Uh, from home. We'll introduce everybody at the end of the of the lecture. Don't don't worry. Um, all right. So um, so so then this explains why um, I believe that uh, uh, frame semantics is uh, better or more useful from a linguistic standpoint than uh, model theoretic truth functional referential. Uh, uh, semantics. Okay. Now you may say, where do these connotations come from? Right. I've given you some examples, but you may want a bit uh, more. So here's a few examples of where connotations come from. Um, so the the most obvious one is they have to do with the attitude of the speaker toward the thing. Right. So if I say that somebody is a resistance fighter. That means that we like the, the, this person, right? We like what they're fighting for. If we call them a terrorist, then of course that means that we don't like them, right? So if you watch one of those, uh, you know, World War II movies where the French resistance are fighting the Germans, the Germans saw the resistance as terrorists, right? And of course the, the French saw them as uh, freedom fighters, right? So, so that's the effective uh, uh, connotation. It's basically a judgment that you pass on the, the, the reference that's reflected in, in the language. Collocative connotations come because the, the two things come in pairs, right? So season the zest, salt and pepper, you know, bread and butter, you know, these, these things. Um, 
social connotation come from things like politeness. If you say open the door as opposed to could you please open the door, you know, clearly one uh, has connotation of politeness, of being nice, and uh, whereas the other one is a, is a direct order. Uh, reflected connotations are my favorite ones. I apologize for the examples, but they're all most, more or less like this. Um, you know, a cock is a rooster, uh, but of course it also has other connotations we're all aware of. Richard is a perfectly fine name, but it also has other connotations, which happens to be the same as the rooster uh, one, right? So, so these are unfortunate um, uh, connotations, but they're part of the culture. And uh, if you grew up uh, in, you know, and went to school, they called you funny names. Um, there is individual connotations, which are connotations that are unique to a, an individual or to, or to a family. Um, so this can be, you know, the name of your first girlfriend or boyfriend, right? So whenever you hear the, the name, uh, I don't know, who was your, your first boyfriend? Any, anybody? Pablo. Whenever you hear the word Pablo, you're like, ah, oh, Pablo, right? <laughs> Whereas I'm thinking like, oh, Picasso, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so completely different uh, emotions that are evoked, right? Um, you know, so, so um, you know, on the other hand, if Pablo was the name of the person, um, you know, who tripped you in high school and uh, made you fall and cry, your connotations are going to be different, right? So that's what an individual uh, connotation is. And then the final one is, uh, in, in many ways, quite interesting. These are social so, uh, connotations. They are dictated by society. They're coded, right? So, for example, you give red roses to somebody that you love. Uh, so it, it means love, like, like you know, physical love. Um, white roses, I think it's for... I think you give white roses to your mother, for example. That It's like, uh, you know completely non-sexual uh, love. Um, chrysanthemums is for the dead in our culture. In Japan, it's for the emperor, right? So completely different connotation, right? So, so you know, you, you, you know, in this country, if, you sh if I show up with a big uh, bouquet of chrysanthemums and I give them to you, you're like, whoa, you know, it's like, <laughs> are you wishing me dead, <laughs> right? Whereas, whereas in Japan, they would be like, oh my God, you know, what a, uh, fantastic present because it's like uh, the flower of the emperor, right? So, so the, 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 the connotations are completely different. The lily is purity, right? So in, in the Catholic tradition, we're talking like really old Catholic tradition here, um, on the day of your first communion, you held the lily, okay? Because it was purity, right? In some other culture, a lily might be something completely different, right? The, you know, it's like garlic. <laughs> <laughs> so you, it's the same. Anywho, um, so um, so if you're interested in reading a little bit more about this, there is this article, uh, which is very good, and you you can download it from there. It's it's widely available on the internet. If you really are interested, I just wrote a paper, literally like two weeks ago which goes into more detail in, on a lot of this about frame semantics, et cetera. So if you're interested, shoot me an email and I will send it to you, but I'm not gonna put it on the, on the web page because it's way too advanced for, for the casual uh, reader. All right, so now let's go to the other presentation. This is a lot of work. All right, so now we're sharing, we're sharing this one. We already talked about this. Um, okay, so in, in this presentation, I, I have sort of a few slides that are mostly integrating what, what, what I talked about in the, in the lecture, which was basically the distinction between referential semantics and mentalist um, um, intentional semantics. Um, if you look at the reading that I put in uh, on the website, uh, I put sort of like the, uh, uh, a word file or a PDF called semantics. There is more than these lectures, right? So, so what I'm doing now is you integrate the reading to the lecture. So, so I'm adding a few things that that are missing 
uh, from uh, in the, the PowerPoint from from the the written chapter um, that, that deals with this, right? All right. So so the first thing is presuppositions, right? So you may have heard of this. We may have mentioned this uh, before. We certainly uh, heard of about it in, in English. Five 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 uh, would be would be my guess, right? But so this is a helpful. Um, refresher on, on, the, on the concept, right? So let's take the sentence, Mary has a PhD, right? And in the previous lecture, we saw that an inference of Mary has a PhD is, for example, that Mary passed, uh, you know, wrote a dissertation, passed the dissertation defense, you know, so because uh, you wouldn't have a PhD unless you did these things, right? She studied uh, for many years and so on and so forth. Now, Let's consider the opposite, the negation of Mary has a PhD, namely Mary does not have a PhD, right? So as you can see, the second sentence there is quite simply the negation of the first sentence, right? So we then ask ourselves, what remains true of both sentences? That is the first one without the negation, the second one with the negation. What remains true no matter what, right? Well, for example, that Mary exists, that PhDs exist, and that Mary could have a PhD, right? So for example, Mary is not a two-year-old, right? If I say uh, my grandson is, is, is four, uh, his name is Liam, if I say, well, Liam doesn't have a PhD, it's nonsense because he's four. He couldn't have a PhD because, you know, he would have a, to have started when he was one, right? So that's absurd, right? Um, you know, it's going to take you at least three years to get a PhD, and of course, at one you can't have already gotten a, a master's in in a field, right? So that's impossible. Therefore, it's a, it would be absurd to say my grandson Liam doesn't have a PhD, right? It just doesn't uh, doesn't make any sense, right? So, by if we say Mary does not have a PhD, Mary could have a PhD. That that is true. Okay. So what we just did is called the negation test, right? So you take a sentence, you negate it, and what remains true of both sentences is a presupposition, okay? Um, you know, and so that's why we say that presupposition persists under or are constant under uh, the negation test. All right, so now if we look at inferences, um, you know, so, so um, you know, if you recall the definition of inference, that there are entailments that they follow logically. So from Mary is married, it follows logically that Mary is not single. There is no way that you can say, oh, Mary is married, but she's single. Right? That doesn't make any sense, right? Um, you know, so, so then the difference between an inference and a presupposition is that inferences follow from a single sentence whereas presuppositions follow from a sentence and its negation. So presuppositions are a subset of inferences, okay? Um, but they are at a sort of a deeper level of meaning, right? So you have sentences, you have inferences, and then you have presuppositions that are a kind of inferences that resist negation, right? So they're kind of deep-seated uh, inferences. Ah. Remember this, so, so sentences, inferences, presuppositions, put like a big uh, red circle in your notes or, or whatever, because when we talk in the next lectures about Paul Grice, the principle of cooperation implicatures, we will rely heavily on these concepts, okay? So highlight them, put a star on it, you know, do whatever you have to do. Um, you know, but, but remember these things because we're going to need these concepts to understand properly what implicatures are. And that's it, super important for the, rest, for the rest of the class. Um, another concept that we need to uh, look at is the idea of ambiguity, okay? Because um, we did mention this ambiguation in passing in uh, uh, the, the first lecture, uh, but we didn't really talk so much about you know, how does it work, okay? Um, and and uh, I'm gonna anticipate here, it works by being in context. Context is the force that disambiguates, right? 
So here you have an example, the word star, you know, which can mean a celebrity or a celestial body like the sun, right? And so here you have on the left, Nicki Minaj, and on the right, the sun. I had to actually Google this because I, I didn't know who she was, but it turns out she's got pink hair. All right. Um, you know, so, so one is a star, the other one is a star too, but a different kind of star, right? Needless to say, when you put it in context, the ambiguity isn't there. Because if I say there were many stars at the Oscars party, clearly you don't expect the sun to be there and, uh, you know, Alpha Centauri and uh, Beta Booth and, uh, you know, a few other stars hanging around, right? Because they would incinerate uh, the Earth within, you know, nanoseconds, right? Conversely, if you said, when I look up at night, I see many stars in the sky, I don't see Nicki Minaj and um, Beyonce and other people like that. I am so up with uh, with uh, <laughs> pop culture. You gotta be impressed. I mean, I'm just I'm just saying here. Um, you know, so so as I said, context disambiguates. You know, so if I say I'd like some coffee, right? I've got here my cup of coffee, right? And I say I'm gonna drink some coffee. As you can see, I just did. Coffee can be solid or liquid, right? I can say I went to the store and I bought, and I bought a pound of coffee, right? In fact, I have a pound of coffee right there. Can you hand me the, the coffee right there so we can do like show and tell? Uh, there you go, thank you very much. I'm not advertising, but it's actually very good <laughs> coffee. So here's solid coffee, here's liquid coffee, right? Now, how does context tell me which it is? Well, I walk into a uh, coffee shop and I say, can I have a cup of coffee? and they hand me a cup of liquid coffee, right? Could they say, sure, and fill a cup with ground uh, uh, coffee? They could, but of course, that's not what you do in a coffee shop, right? Now, you can be, notice, incidentally, that you can buy ground coffee at a coffee shop, but you have to specify. You have to say, I would like to buy a pound of, of ground coffee. You cannot say, I'd like some coffee, please, because then they'll give you the liquid stuff, right? Now. Having said this, sometimes this ambiguation doesn't work, right? So I gave you two examples there on the, on the slide. Uh, the first one on the left says the chicken is ready to eat, right? So normally we think, oh, we're, we're going to eat the chicken. But here, to see the chicken has the fork and the knife. The chicken is ready to eat. The chicken is going to eat, right? So this is syntactically ambiguous, right? And the other one is a pragmatic ambiguity. Uh, one parent says to the other, can we talk, right? And of course, because normally what it means, if I say, can we talk, that means we have business to transact. Right? Then if you're my daughter, what it means is you screwed up and I'm about to yell at you, <laughs> right? Um, you know, so, so, so whereas of course here, because it's a parrot, right? A parrot talks. You literally, it literally means, are we capable of talking, right? So there is a pragmatic ambiguity here between, are we capable of talking, or we need, we have business to transact. Okay, I, I doubt that the you screwed up uh, meaning is available for the for the parents. Okay, but so this is an example of context failing to disambiguate. I mean, it's funny precisely because both meanings are there, okay? So by the way, if you're interested in humor, I've just told you the, the biggest, uh, um, uh, you know, basically the basic theory of, uh, of humor is that there's two meanings. Um, all right, so finally, and this is a um, um, somewhat tricky uh, uh, part. Can we distinguish between semantics and pragmatics, right? I mean, the title of this class is pragmatics, right? So, so you might say, and it's a, it's a fair question, why are we talking about semantics if this is a class about pragmatics, okay? And my answer to that is come over here and let me hit you on the head with, with a large stick, okay? Now, actually, my answer is it will be revealed in due time. <laughs> um, so, why are we talking about semantics? Okay, well, because you can't have some pragmatics without semantics. 
can you distinguish the two? Can you put like a, 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 a post and say everything to the, to the left of this sign is semantics and everything to the right is pragmatics? Can you draw a line, a boundary between the two disciplines? Well, people have tried, okay? So for example, uh, here, um, this is a very influential uh, definition. Uh, as you will recall, the, the very popular uh, theory of, of um, uh, semantics that, that is the most popular in linguistics is that the meaning is, has to do with truth, right? The referential uh, semantics. So they said, okay, so pragmatics is meaning minus the truth conditions. So if you take out the truth conditions, that's semantics. Any meaning that's left is pragmatics, right? And it's not a bad idea, right? It's neat, right? I mean, it has, um, you know, um, some, you know, prima facie, as they, as they say in, uh, in um, uh, philosophical uh, debate, you know, the, at first brush, it looks actually quite clever, right? So does it work? Well, no. Life is hard, okay? Well, why, why do I say that it doesn't work? Well, let's look at it. Let's pick uh, an example. We're in Texas uh, right here. So we, we are, uh, this is very a uh, daily uh, thing for us. The horse is not in the barn. Do you have horses in your group? No. My wife, Dr. Pickering, has, has a horse. So let's, let's say that it's Danny, Dr. Pickering's horse. And she comes home and says, the horse is not in the barn, okay? So what is the semantics of the sentence? It's actually very, very simple. It's here, okay? And it says, there is a location, okay? The location predicate has two arguments. One is the horse, and the second one is the location of the horse. And the location is not, this tilde indicates not, the barn. Okay, in other words, the horse is anywhere except in the barn, right? Brilliant, right? So that's the semantics. And then the pragmatics would be, well, it's the fifth time that the horse has run away. Dr. Pickering forgot to close the, the, the barn door. I've told her, you know, five times. I'm upset because now I'm going to have to go and find the horse in the middle of the field and the, the neighbor is going to complain because the horse, uh, uh, I don't know what the horse does, I've got no idea. Uh, anyway, um, so that's the pragmatics, right? So, so maybe she's like, uh, you're the one who left the, the barn door open, so it's your fault that the horse ran away, right? So it, she may be blaming me for this or or maybe she's complaining about it, or maybe she wants to commiserate, right? So these would be the pragmatics of the sentence, right? So far, so good, right? So, so far, we are working within this definition, right? It's brilliant, right? So the meaning would be the location of the horse is not in the barn, and the pragmatics would be, well, everything else that this means. I'm upset, uh, I forgot to close the barn door, or whatever, right? Brilliant. Well, not so fast, unlike the horse, which is very fast, as you can tell. So let's look at this. In the sense, we said the horse, right? We didn't say a horse, okay? We said the horse. Now, what does the mean? In this case, it means, well, it's a known horse, right? So, so again, assuming there is Dr. Pickering and me talking, um, you know, and, and she comes in and says, the horse is not in the barn. The indicates that it's a horse that we both are familiar with, right? That we can identify this horse immediately without any further discussion, okay? There is no need to say, remember the neighbor bought a horse, uh, you know, six months ago, not the black one, the one that's white and the, that horse ran away, right? If I say the horse is not in the barn, it means that you and I already know which horse we're talking about, okay? I, I do not need to further qualify this horse, right? And in this particular case, it would be true because she only has one horse, right? So she's not gonna tell me the neighbor's horse ran away. What do I care? 
I mean, she could tell me, but then she would have to say, the neighbor's horse is not in the barn. She wouldn't say, the horse is not in the barn. Because then I would say, oh, our horse is not in the barn, right? So, so this, however, this information is pragmatic information because it's the ictic, right? That is, it's related to the situation. If Dr. Pickering had been talking to the neighbor, she would have had to say, my horse, right? Because the neighbor has horses as well. And if you say, the horse is not in the barn, the neighbor says, oh, crap, and then goes out and tries to catch his horse or her horse. Um, and then says, what, what are you talking about? My horse is there, right? So in other words, this the, and by the way, the barn is the same thing, right? Means that it is an identifiable barn, that we know which barn we're talking about, right? So, so in other words, um, this information, that it's a known horse, that it's a known barn, is not part of the semantics the truth functional semantics of, 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 of the sentence, which we, as you recall, it just says there is a location, the horse is there and it's not the barn, okay? So, so, so this information that we know which horse we're talking about and we know which barn we're talking about is not in this definition. Or in other words, there is no clear cut boundary between semantics and pragmatics because in order to understand the semantics of the sentence the horse is not in the barn you have to know things about who's talking where are they talking what are they talking about what's the situation in which they're talking about and that is pragmatics right because they're the ictics right so in other words as i said this idea, oh, let's have a nice boundary between semantics and pragmatics, just doesn't work, okay? So then people have said, okay, fine, fine. It doesn't work, but it's modular, right? Now, what does modularity mean? Let's look at this, right? So this is a famous um, illusion. Look at these two uh, lines. Right, the, the one between uh, sort of pointy uh, triangles and the other one in red. Would you say that the top line is the same length as the bottom line? Yes, no? Uh, no, right, that is they're different in length, right? Do you agree? Yes, right? In fact, they're exactly the same, okay? That's why it's called an illusion, right? Um, you know, so, why is that the case? Well, because our mind is, is set in such a way that when there is this kind of configuration, we see the lines as having different lengths. Okay? Now, now that I've told you, look at it again. Do you now see that they're exactly the same length? No, they still look shorter. The bottom one still looks shorter than the top one. That tells you that vision, which tells you that they're different lengths were in fact they're the same length. And by the way, if you want to measure it, print out the page, measure it with a, with a uh, ruler, you'll see that they're exactly the same length. <clears throat> so vision is independent from semantics, that is meaning, because I just told you that they're the same length, but that doesn't change the way you perceive them. You still see them as having different lengths, whereas in fact they have the same length. Right? So that tells you then that vision is a module and semantics is a separate module, okay? Um, you know, so, so that's, a, that's a good example. So here's another uh, uh, example, that's a linguistic uh, example. So remember our word star that we, that we had a minute ago and we said it has two separate meanings, right? So it can be the, the celestial body or it can be the celebrity, right? So, sorry. That's the problem. So when you hear the word star, and there's an enormous amount of research that has uh, shown these things, all the meaning, both meanings in our case, get activated, regardless of the context, okay? So when I say, um, Nicki Minaj is a big star, you still activate the meaning of the sun. 
okay? Even though in context, you know perfectly well that it's not the case, right? But it gets activated anyway, and it lasts for about 200 milliseconds. That's two tenths of a second. After that, it's suppressed and it no longer has any effect. But for the first 200 milliseconds, it is active and it has some effects on, on, uh, on people. You can prove this with various uh, uh, psycholinguistic uh, experiments, okay? Now, the fact that the activation of all the meanings happens automatically and there's nothing you can do to stop about it, okay? Even if I tell you, now, don't think of celestial bodies, Nicki Minaj is a star, you still will activate um, the, the both meanings, right? So this tells us that activation of all the meanings is a module, okay? Because it's automatic and it's not affected by information outside. So is semantics a module, right? Vis-a-vis -vis pragmatics, right? Can, can, can semantics be activated without pragmatics? Well, no, okay? So look at the word cut, okay? So what's the meaning of cut? Well, you know, one way is to sever, right? To sever means to detach two things, you know? So, so if I sever um, a blade of grass, it's no longer attached to the ground, right? Brilliant, so now look at cut the grass, cut the paper and cut one's finger, right? Now, the action that you do is different depending on the context, right? So it, when you're cutting grass, you're cutting horizontally. Right? Your lawnmower, the blades are parallel to the ground. When you're cutting paper, you're cutting with the scissors. And most likely the, the blades are vertical and the piece of paper is horizontal. It would be very strange to cut. Like, I mean, you can do it, but the natural way of doing it is, is, this, is this way. Now, cutting one's finger is a completely different thing. Okay, because if I completely severed my finger from the rest of my hand, I would have to say, that I cut off my finger. In cutting a finger, it's just making a small cut. I mean, it couldn't be a deep cut, I guess, but, but not completely severing off the, the finger, right? Um, you know, which is much worse, I'm told. I mean, it's like I'm not a medical professional, but, um, you know, so, so, so what action you are doing actually differs depending on the context in which you use the word cut, right? So that tells you that clearly semantics is not a module because we activate different images of cutting depending on the context in which we're using the word cut, right? So, so then semantics is not, uh, is not uh, modular. So then finally, after all of this, we said, okay, so it's not, um, there is no clear cut boundary. It's not a module. At least can we distinguish between linguistic pragmatic that is grammaticalized and pragmatics at large, right? Um, you know, so, um, you know, so this would be things like, um, um, you know, but what for, for example, a very good example is the TV pronouns, right? You, I'm sure you've encountered this in your sociolinguistics class, uh, but, but you have like in, in French, in Spanish, in Italian, you can address somebody with the T pronoun, two in French, two in Italian, and uh, uh, what's it in Spanish? Uh, usted, right? Correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does anybody speak Spanish here? No, but I think it's usted. Um, and then you have the V pronoun, which is voi in Italian, vu in French, and vosotros in, in, in Spanish, right? So, which indicate it's plural, but it also indicates respect, whereas the singular indicates familiarity, right? So, so this is grammaticalized, right? It's coded, it's conventional, right? It is you, if you use T, the T pronoun, okay? So, so like for example, and it corresponds, <coughs> sorry, it corresponds in English to using first name when you address somebody, right? So if you address me as Sal, you're addressing me in the familiar mode. If you address me as Dr. Atardo, title and last name, then you're addressing me formally. Right? So if you address me as Sal, it's informal, friendly. If you address me as Dr. Atardo, it's formal and respectful. Right? If you address me as Dr. Sal, no one knows who the hell you're talking about. Um, 
people are confused. So don't do that. And I, plus, I feel like a TV celebrity, like Dr. Phil. I always wanted to have my, my own talk show. Um, you know, so um, now, so then we could say, all right, so then the pragmatics that's coded in the language is linguistic pragmatic, and then you would have non linguistic, in other words, general uh, uh, pragmatic, right? And again, that sounds like nice and, and very neat, uh, but unfortunately, that's not the way it works. And people have tried to uh, make uh, this distinction. And the reason here is very simple, um, that pragmatics and grammar are in a dynamic relationship, right? So they keep changing, right? So for example, take, can you pass the salt, right? Now, when you say, can you pass the salt, what do you mean? Asking someone to pass the salt. You're asking someone to pass the salt. But in fact, literally what you're saying is, are you capable of passing the salt? Mm -hmm. Okay? But it's become so idiomatic that now we all understand it directly as, please pass the salt. It's just polite. Mm -hmm. Okay? The difference between pass the salt and can you pass the salt is I'm being polite. Right? So can you pass the salt has become the idiomatic, polite way of requesting the salt, right? But originally what it indicated was capacity, right? Now, so, so this has been idiomaticized into an expression that, that indicates politeness. Politeness is a pragmatic phenomenon, right? Now, it's going to at some point become grammaticalized, so it's gonna be part of grammar, right? So, so this is an intermediate step between a purely pragmatic thing and something that's partially encoded you still can figure it out, okay? Now, when I say, I will go to the store tomorrow, do you realize that I'm expressing my intention to go to the store, not that it's a future? No, you don't, right? Because you, that's not, no longer available to the native speaker, right? But in fact, will, as in I will go to the store, comes from Old English willan, which meant to intend. Right? So what it meant was, I have in my intention going to the store. Right? Now, if I intend to do something, am I doing it now? No. You intend to do something in the future. So this intentionality then became associated with the future. And at some point, intention became fu future uh, and then became part of the grammar. Okay. So what this tells us is that the relationship between what's in the grammar and what's outside of the grammar is not static. It changes constantly, right? Here you see on the way to becoming grammar, it's already idiomatic, and here it's already completely fully grammaticalized, okay? So in other words, it's not a static distinction, it's a moving line, and therefore trying to have this distinction isn't gonna work ultimately, because it keeps changing, okay? All right, so um, that's all for today. Plenty of stuff uh, to uh, look at. So let's recap. You now have um, two, two and a half uh, PowerPoint uh, lectures where I've, we've talked about these, these things. You have one chapter from the book, um, the, the Pickering and Atardo book that we're working on, uh, that's in your um, LMS. Um, you know, so you can now put all of this together and you will have a good uh, idea of semantics and the connection uh, between um, semantics and pragmatics, okay? So our next step uh, is going to be then to go into pragmatics, you know, sort of com concretely, right? So now we've done the preliminary work of saying, what do we need to know about semantics in order to talk about pragmatics? So in the next lecture, we're gonna start talking about pragmatics per se. All right.